thrust, response is engine 5, engine 3, engine 1, ladder 3, ladder 2, rescue 1. We've got smoke showing. Division 1, you're on location, block 23, reporting smoke show on 727. Welcome to Job Talks Podcast. Our goal is to facilitate knowledge sharing. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests on the show belong solely to the people expressing them. We do not represent the departments, cities, or towns we work for. All right, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Job Talks. We are on our field trip still. Field trip. We We're haven't left yet. Out here with still here. Captain Lisa Hamill from the Munson Fire Department. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Uh, Thanks, so Lisa. Last week, Barry's <laughs> super familiar with everybody here because he's been here since he was like four years old. Um, so on last week, last week's episode, Barry interviewed um, the chief and talked a lot about uh, like considerations of managing uh, a blended staffing, limited staffing department. Um, this week, kind of wanted to talk more about the operations of a limited staffing and a blended staffing department. So I guess before we even get into that, uh, tell us a little bit about you, how you ended up in the fire service, how you ended up in Munson. Obviously, you came through the ranks here. Sure. Uh, so I started in the fire service in 2012 uh, in Warren, which is the town I grew up in, just a couple of towns over. I started as a first responder in, with an interest in EMS. Um, and then as I started with that, I said, oh, maybe I'll be interested in fire too. And it kind of just progressed on a natural path from there. Um, I started full time here in 2018, but I joined on the call force in 2015. So I've been here for about seven years total. Um, I took an open lieutenant's position, applied for it, uh, went through the interview process uh, with the chief at the time, and uh, then progressed from there to the open captain's position again, um, just kind of checking the boxes along the way. Uh, so I went from a our lieutenants do company uh, operations to the captain's position, which kind of oversees the lieutenants. Uh, okay. And so here we are today. So, so as a captain, so I, I guess the next question would be, what do you guys staff as your normal daily staffing? Um, so your career department versus what do you guys staff for a call department? Yeah, so we run in three shifts, um, A, B, and C. Each shift has two, a uh, minimum of two personnel, full-time, 24 hours. Uh, my shift currently has three. And then right now we're running a Monday through Friday, eight to four position. So on Monday through Friday, eight to four, I have four people on my shift, which is great. It oh, gives awesome. us the opportunity yeah. to fully staff a truck or staff a truck and an ambulance or staff two ambulances, depending on what the call is. Um, but so for the most part, the other shifts are running two or three during the week, during the day. Yeah. Okay. Makes a huge difference. So, so on your, on your shift, um, do you also have a lieutenant or are you the officer? I don't. Okay. Um, so in none of the other shifts have an actual uh, rank officer. So it just goes by seniority. Um, okay. So the senior person on that shift is essentially in charge of that shift and ensuring that all the operations, the daily stuff that need to happen goes on. Okay. So currently um, we do have an open lieutenant's position, a full-time lieutenant's position uh, that we just haven't quite filled yet. And so I'm the only full-time officer besides the chief. Oh, okay. Awesome. So there's so there's one lieutenant, one captain, and then the, the chief for your office. Space for, yes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. What's the promotional process like? Uh, so we aren't civil service, so we don't do testing. Right. Uh, basically, the position opens up. It's posted uh, to all the staff that it's open. Um, if you have interest in it, you fill out an application, and then there's an interview process. Uh, for example, mine for both my lieutenants and captain's promotion was with area chiefs yep. um, and then our HR staff and just asking various questions about leadership, uh, solving, you know, interpersonal issues, the things that you would encounter as an officer. Uh, and then they made their decisions from there. So we do have that uniqueness in that we don't have a testing process. Um, and then it's preference based. So if you have your fire officer one, fire officer two, um, fire instructor, et cetera, yeah. obviously the more credentialing you have, the higher Makes you, you more are more competitive able to, candidate. Yep. Yeah. So they, they put a value on taking the training and resources, Absolutely, which, yeah. which, uh, from just talking to you a little bit is something that you, you've definitely taken advantage of. Yeah. You, you have to, um, especially being a small department, 
you know, our, our pool of knowledge is smaller because we have less people. So you right. have to be able to just take advantage of all the opportunities that are granted to you right. to be the best employee and officer that you can be. Right. Um, just backing up just a little bit. So, uh, you were an EMS before you got in fire. Fire wasn't like your probably primary yeah. thought. Are you first generation firefighter? I am. I do have an uncle that was a call firefighter in Warren, but as far as my family goes, I'm the first in my family. Awesome. Very we, cool. we both are. I always like asking that question because I think it's, um, I think it's a testament to the fire service in general and like the passion that people display in the fire service when you get people who like I was I thought I was going to be a career military guy I'm a first generation firefighter and then you get in and I'm sure that there's probably a senior person that like mentored you and like built that passion and then seeing it like translate you know like we've had um chief Nardelli on the show and uh, he's done a class for us too and he he always says like I'm not I'm not the one making this stuff up somebody yeah. somebody told it to me and I'm passing it on so I just think yeah. it's a really cool like testament to the to the way the fire service works that you take somebody you bring them in you build that passion for the job and then here mm-hmm. you are you know several years later yeah I think captain for me I was doing um like post-graduating college I wasn't quite sure where I was going and I had been uh, eight years in the National Guard and had just gotten out and I kind of was looking for something to fill that sort of like service hole of yep. that you get with the military that you're serving a higher purpose definitely um, and the fire service just ended up being that for me that's really awesome that's really awesome um, so you guys obviously face a lot of challenges being both a limited staffing where you only have a couple of people on shift at a time mm-hmm. and a blended staffing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Barry had alluded to in the interview with the chief about not being two separate departments and being one department as a, as a leader within the department, how do you foster that environment that, you know, these guys have, might've chosen a primary profession that wasn't the fire service, but mm-hmm. still care enough about doing this work and the people that they live in their community that they come in and do it on a call basis and the people who have chosen to make this like a full-time job how do you keep that balance so that people work with each other as one instead of like view each other as two separate yeah it can definitely be a really difficult challenge um our full-time personnel we put in a lot of hours here it's it roughs out to about like 27 2800 annually that were scheduled here um without including coming back for anything. So you really feel very personal about the building and about the, the job itself. Like this is my, I pretty much live here. This is my second house. This is my second family. You you guys run three shifts. So that's a 56 hour, 56 hour week. Yeah. Yeah. So there is kind of that balance of, well, you're a call person, you're coming into my house. Yep. And so you, sometimes the heckles go up right away if something's not done correctly or maybe how you would want it. Um, but just kind of fostering that understanding of you're here almost 3,000 hours a year and they're here maybe 300 hours a year. Right. So if we moved a piece of equipment on the truck and they don't know exactly where it is, just be nice and help right. them. You know, don't, yeah. don't automatically take that defensive. Um, and like you said, just stressing that they're putting in this time on top of their regular job or taking time right. away from maybe their families to come in for calls or trainings and things. And just having that understanding that they're putting in this sort of extra effort in their life to better the department and to better the community that they're living in. And so having that mutual respect and the same thing on, on the other side, if we're talking to um, call employees that listen maybe he didn't mean that it's been a long week or a little tired yeah. today. You know, right. let's just, let's just hash, hash this out professionally. Yeah. Right. I, sorry. No, I, no. I do think there's a, a unique benefit too, of like, and it's a very difficult or I don't want to say difficult, but unique space for you to be operating in, uh, you know, on, on the career side, right? Like we see a lot of people used to come from the trades, maybe not as much anymore as like society as a whole changes, but you can still have people on the call force that like might be subject matter experts, you know, yeah. like mechanics, yeah. carpenters, yep. right? So you, I feel like you have that benefit. Yeah. And so we have, for example, we have one call member that drives truck for a living. So he's great. You know, he's our best driver because he does that for a living. I, I'm not a truck driver, you know, I trust when he tells me something driving wise, I trust his opinion on that. And you don't have to be full time to have that, that respect. Um, 
carpenters, like you said, electricians, you know, people that have specific knowledge in certain areas, you know, maybe we go to a call and I don't know anything about this because it's not my field of expertise, yeah. but Hey, maybe this guy that does this for a living does know. Yeah. So you do get those kind of unique facets thrown in there as well. Right. And I think that's hugely important. And, and I think like, um, kind of going back to what you said, uh, before about having like a limited knowledge pool, having a call department increases that knowledge pool because, mm-hmm we do a lot of stuff that's fire based, but a lot of it is knowing building construction, knowing yeah. systems, knowing things like that. And so, so you might have like a limited pool of knowledge just by your sheer numbers, but because you employ people that work in the outside world and do mm-hmm. these trades, as Barry said, yeah. you know, you kind of increase that. Yeah. Um, an- another thing, and I think we've said it a, a, a hundred times is like, it's much harder to hide. Yep. On a, on a department when there's two people. So yeah. when you when you get to a scene and it's complex, and or even when it's not, but like especially when it's complex and it's something like, you know, you don't see every scenario every day or even mm-hmm. once in a year, you know, and, and you, you have to be, you have to be the, the knowledge. Decision maker. The yeah. decision maker on that stuff. And like, I really try to stress that to new people, whether they're full-time or, or part-time, that it might just be me and you or me and you and one other right. person. And so I really need you to know your job to the right. best of your capabilities. And if there's something you don't know, that's okay, but let's learn it together if it's something that you don't know because we can't be caught out when it's an emergency for a citizen. That's not the time to learn. Right. So we really, I try to stress that with people that really, there's nobody else sometimes except for you yeah. and the person yeah. sitting next yeah. to you. And our, our hats off to you guys. Cause like, I, I often think about this. We've talked about it, you know, at length, you know, we're, lo- we're lucky in this, you know, every department has its strengths and weaknesses, but we're lucky in the city. Like we're not having to make the choice between suppression, search, ventilation, mm-hmm. like you, like with, you know, if you're lucky during the day, you have a full staffed engine company, like you have a little bit more flexibility, but sometimes you have to make the choice between like, Hey, is this an occupied structure? Right. Are we going to prioritize conducting a search versus prioritize suppression? Like it's so, I mean, my hat's off to you guys. Yeah. I think that's, and, and on that, on that note is like, are we going to, okay, we're going to do suppression, but where's our water source? So you guys have a pretty unique yeah. um, situation here where you have uh, about a third of mm-hmm. the town is, yeah. is in a hydrant district. And the town is a little over 44 square miles. Um, so it's it's really not a lot that actually right. has reliable water year round. Right. Which is crazy because Cambridge is 6.2 square miles. <laughs> yeah. And we, yeah. You can you can throw a rock at a hydrant yeah. from, I think, just about anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and at, we're going to walk over. Uh, th- so you showed me a map earlier when we were walking around. Yeah. It kind of showed your water sources and stuff that's in the town. And we're, we're going to go over there in a minute and take a look at it because I think it's 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 interesting and and another thing you know barry says uh, all the time is you don't just show up and put the fire out and bring your tools you have to bring your own water yeah in a lot of instances uh we are bringing our own water and really if we're rolling an engine we have a thousand gallons if i have enough to staff an engine and tank her out the door i have four thousand gallons which you guys know operationally isn't a lot of water to start out with um if we roll mutual aid right away uh, best case scenario, 15 minutes for them to get there. Worst right. case, 30, 40. So sometimes you could it's be nuts. waiting. So it's really a lot of pre-planning, uh, really knowing the town, knowing where the water is, knowing the time of year it is. Maybe in the right. summer, this water source isn't reliable um, and knowing where your where your assets are. Yeah. So Captain Donovan from uh, from Boston, he was at our lecture series and he had said something about um, talking about aggressive firefighting and how it doesn't necessarily like that term because aggressive to this person is very different right. from aggressive to this person. And, and to me, that just kind of like is one of those situations. So like aggressive to, to me is we're going in, we're making entry, we're searching or putting a hose in, in operation with 30 people at our back mm-hmm. to you. Aggressive firefighting is doing that same thing with zero people zero behind people your back. Right. Or if you're lucky, you know, hopefully you one or two, or, but maybe not. Day <laughs> and you have the chief. Um, so I, I just think it's really interesting. Uh, I think it's important. Like we both Barry obviously started here. He tells us all the time. Uh, <laughs> Haven't left yet. And I, I got my start on a, on a small blended department, a little bit bigger than this, but a small blended department. And, uh, I think that it really sets, I, I think it gives an advantage sometimes to me personally to have that knowledge of, of like, you know, working limited or like, yep. so you guys don't, don't staff a truck, but you know, we had a truck. So being able to do like 
engine operations and some ladder operations and stuff. I feel like it just kind of helped for me personally, make me a well-rounded, um, firefighter. And I always appreciate that. Yeah. You kind of have to be not an expert, but at least familiar with every aspect of it where, like you said, you know, truck companies might not be familiar with engine work, but here it's, even though it says engine on the side, it's really everything. You might show up and have to operate another mutual aid towns Mm -hmm. truck and stuff like that, which, which I think is, so we talked a little bit about, um, we did an episode about operational realities and we talked about these smaller departments and we talked specifically about like you, in a, in a department like this, you really, every department has to, but you guys really have to know your mutual aid and know not only what you have for resources in house, but mm-hmm. what you have for resources that are coming, coming 15 minutes away, you know, where your tanker is coming from, where right. your ladder truck's coming from. I think like I talked to you a little bit, it's interesting. You guys don't have a ladder, but you guys have almost no buildings that are over three stories. In yeah. Town, we right? don't have a lot of, uh, immediate need for a ladder. There are some larger buildings in town, um, where we would just have to call mutual aid and do what we could with ground ladders in the meantime. Uh, it's such a huge budget expense for the town uh, right. to purchase a ladder. We would really have to weigh out the benefit of it versus the cost, um, how much use it would get. Of course, we'd right. advertise it. We'd roll it to every call. Right. But um, it's really what can we accomplish? And, you know, okay, we roll that ladder truck. Now do I not have an engine because I chose right. to roll the ladder so it's it's really because of the cost of it um and physically it won't fit in the station right now it's <laughs> <Yeah. That's> a <laughs> but, good reason as well but it's really something we have to think about and we do have almost every town that touches us has a ladder um right. that that we typically have access to so we've kind of made do you know in the meantime right um we actually featured uh, a fire from Munson in one of mm-hmm. our um, seen size up scenarios. Uh, I don't remember what episode that was. The deck, we, the decks were on fire. The rear oh, what, yeah. were on fire. So yeah. I have a question, and uh, and this is just I love I love getting into this. I don't want to call it a debate because everybody has difference of opinion, and all opinions are valid, especially based on your staffing and, and needs. But um, we talked about like operation of a blitz gun, mm-hmm. and you guys have one, so. Yeah. Um, this is just kind of just a random out there question for you. So, and you know, the fire I'm talking about, yes. we can insert a picture. I'll send it to Nick. Um, so you guys can see it again, but we had talked about the possibility for this specific fire and, and I'm picturing the, in my mind, it's the white house, the rear mm-hmm. porches are going mm-hmm. front side is the access, um, bringing a blitz gun and putting it to the, to the rear of the structure and leaving that to operate on its own so that you guys can make entry. Do you, do you see the blitz gun as like a, a primary attack weapon or a defensive or secondary attack weapon on your own? So I think really it would be case by case for us here because of our staffing, um, because of our water supply. Right. So yeah. blitz guns are rated 500 gallons a minute, usually at max, you know, yeah. maximum effectiveness. Um, for that particular fire, it was outside the hydrant district. So our initial engine rolled with a thousand gallons. We op- uh, request a mutual aid immediately so you have another thousand coming um, and then the tanker was the second piece out so three thousand so let's say I have five thousand on scene it's not a lot of operational time with the blitz right um, it would have definitely had its place at that fire because of the proximity to our neighboring community we did get mutual aid fairly quickly um, we do a lot of monitoring each other's frequencies yeah. and knowing when we're going to need to roll uh, so it definitely would have had its place there. Um, would it have its place during the day, during the week, when I have two, maybe three people on a truck plus the chief, and if we're outside of Hydrant District and I can't support that water supply, I would probably say no. I would want to prioritize um, entry, if possible, with a hand line and see what we could knock down with that. So it's really, for us, very situational. Um, how much water do I have? Am I in a water district? How many hands do I have on scene to accomplish this? Yeah. The nice thing about the blitz is it's hands free. You set right. it, set, set it, it and forget it, right? But if I set it and forget it, and now I don't have any water, we've right. kind of yeah. right. defeated it anyway. Right. Does every truck that you guys have here is that thousand gallons? And that's pretty much uh, our engines here. are, and then the yeah. tanker is three thousand. Yeah, I just I like that I like that question. It's just I don't know why like uh, people have very strong opinions on it. So yeah. it's always fun to talk to people. And yeah. you know, like my school of thought is like that's a great primary weapon for a, a limited staffing situation. Yeah. Yeah. So you can accomplish a couple of tasks. 
you know, for us, I think it's always quicker to pull a two and a half off for exterior yeah. fire, and we don't have to yeah. worry about the. And in that particular that particular fire that you're referencing, if we were to blitz the back of it, that would have been a pretty long lay from the road. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of competing problems at that fire. The we there couldn't like get fence. close to the road. There was, there was yeah. a fence. If we had gotten too close, we would have gone down the embankment. So there was a lot of competing issues, which happens at a lot of our scenes because of, you know, small towns, small roads, traffic, size of our trucks, um, water supply. So right. it's definitely a constant thing in everyone's mind when we are right. responding to calls. Uh, another unique thing, uh, maybe not unique, but one of the things that you guys have for your engines is you guys run all 1500 gallon a minute pumps, right? Yes. And that's for drafting? Yeah, so you 1500 is the kind of gold standard for drafting we do i don't want to say more drafting than hydrant but we do a significant amount of drafting we practice on drafting quite a bit um, because it is kind of a finesse thing yeah. uh, that has to be learned and it sometimes requires a lot of troubleshooting um, so we really make sure that the drivers are well versed in it because if it is a situation where we're drafting, the last thing we want in that moment is somebody that doesn't know how to solve a problem quickly. Right. I, and, uh, another thing we're going to go look at in a few minutes is your tanker truck, which mm -hmm. I just learned. I have no, like I did a little bit of drafting. Um, like I drafted a brush fire once at my old job, you know, in Wayland and, uh, but generally like drafting, I've done some drafting, but I don't have a ton of experience with it. And I've never operated or really learned tankers at all. And mm -hmm. I just learned today, talking to you guys, that you guys have like this vacuum tanker, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. so it, it really frees up our ability to have to either go to the water source that's been identified. Let's say someone's already filling there. We can fill from another source because it's essentially like a big shop vac. We can just stick the strainer in and suck the water up. Right. Um, also, if the water supply uh, engine hasn't been established yet, because usually our water supply is mutual aid, so someone's coming in from another town. If they're not there yet, the tanker can still go and obtain water very quickly. Right. Um, so it's definitely a benefit out here in the rural area. Hey, you said that, so it's 3,000 gallons, and you mm -hmm. can offload and, and intake that whole tank in about three minutes. Yeah, uh, thir three minutes nuts. each. Three minutes to offload yep. and three minutes to yeah. To so we can what's called pressure dump it. So it can gravity dump where you're just opening the hatch and it flows out, or you can pressurize it to push the water out. So right. if we need to dump quickly and you know get to the next stop, we can do that. That's really wow. cool. Um, what? Just, I'm gonna put you on a spot a little bit. <laughs> what is your um, Having come up through the ranks in the in the Munson Fire Department, again, with this blended staffing and limited staffing, mm -hmm. what would you say your favorite thing about this work environment is? Um, I, I like that we're a small group because uh, you really get the opportunity to get to know everyone. Um, and like any small family, we have our differences of opinion. But at the end of the day, we all have the same goal, and that's to keep the community safe and um to keep educating people and, and make sure that they're doing the right thing. So having that small staffing, uh, you really get an opportunity to really be friends with each person that you're working with um, in, in different capacities. You know, everyone's personality is oh, different. Yeah. So maybe we joke, tell jokes with this person, but this person, I want to know like what's going on with your family. And right. mm. uh, I think that's really nice. I personally have always said, um, I don't know that I would enjoy working for a big city like Cambridge. I like that I get to see the citizens that I serve on a regular basis. I see them at the post office. I see them at the grocery store. Um, I'm able to ask them how they're doing or, you know, right. how did that end up for you? Um, and I really enjoy that aspect of small town fire and EMS is that I get to a lot of times see the, the other end of it yeah. after you're, the you're call. You're bested. So yes. speaking of, on the way in this morning... <laughs> I happened to drive by a Munson fire engine pulled over on the side of the road, and I thought it was an emergency incident, and I got the little GoPro out to film as I went by, <laughs> and what I actually saw was uh, you out talking to a bunch of kids. What yes. were you doing? Uh, so fire prevention month is October, um, but I was a little late with that specific visit, um, some scheduling conflicts. So I go to the schools um, to do fire prevention education in October, we go to the elementary schools and do pre-K through six. And I also, in the last couple of years, have been doing daycare and homeschool visits. So that we have a couple of home daycares in town. So they've asked us to come 
and do some education with the kids who aren't in school yet. So your pre pre K kids, three, awesome. four years old. Um, and then we've been doing some Cub Scout and Girl Scout education as well here for their badges. So that that uh, site you saw me at was a home daycare. Yep. Um, so we sat down and did a little bit of fire prevention. And then, of course, they always want to see the truck. So we yeah. went out and talked about the truck. Did you do a thing called Hot or Not Hot? We did do a thing called Hot or Not Hot. Oh, that's what I heard. <laughs> and I found some of these props. So yes. so this is so this was a pre pre K. Yeah, so thing. I do that with the pre pre K kids because it's good uh, for them for their age group, and I also do it with the pre K and kindergarten kids in it's the a little school. Cool in here. I'm just gonna uh, sit by this. So so what I thought was interesting is that so we, obviously yeah. we came in and we talked to you and we saw this and yeah. you're doing this for that can stay there. Um, <laughs> you're doing this for pre pre K kids, mm -hmm. right? And we yes. gave this test to Barry. And Barry actually <laughs> failed it. So um, I'm it's just going to ask the audience. I'm just going to ask the audience one one question out of these: Is it hot or not hot? And it's this steaming <laughs> cup of coffee or hot chocolate. I disagree because you could be warm and you could be outside. I just feel like there'd be a lazy steam covering the entire surface you know of the steam? liquid. <laughs> It'd be covering the entire surface of the liquid instead of pushing with volume. Yeah. Heat heat equals volume and pressure. Mm. We learned that about smoke. So steam's kind of the same way. Mm. So to our to our to our listeners and viewers, I guess our viewers mostly. Would you say this cup of coffee is hot? No, lukewarm. <laughs> Show them the spicy bee, dude. This we decided is not that cold one's nor confusing. hot, but as Definitely John said, spicy, spicy, spicy. So, spicy. Um, so I think that's it for like the interview portion. I think it'd be yeah. really awesome um, if you take us around uh, sure. to see some of this kind of unique stuff that you guys have being this. Limited department? Yeah, let's do it. Let's go. All right, so we talked about in the episode your map of yes. your town. And yep. uh, every town's got a map, but I thought it was kind of interesting because uh, you were talking about about a third of your um, town is in the Hydrant District. So yeah. where is that? So we have what we call it Central District. So this little sort of middle slice is all of our hydrants. So anything outside of that purple border is going to be no hydrant. So we're outside the Water District, essentially. Which is absolutely insane. Yeah. And so you guys use um, like different lakes, uh, water areas yeah. to, to be able to draft so from. So this particular map has our water draft sites marked in W, landing zones are the green rectangles. Um, it's a little bit touch and go sometimes. So our really reliable ones are going to be our lakes and ponds. Um, some of our smaller ones, like you can see this one down here is a small pond on somebody's property um, that they put in a dry hydrant for us. Uh, we haven't tested it in a while, so we don't know if it's broken, if the stranger's clogged up, it might work, right. it might not. Um, some of our more swampy areas might have water in the winter, or if it's been a good uh, water rain year, but in the summer it might be completely dried up. So, so you really got to know, know what you're coming into. So yeah. one of the things I found interesting was we talked about doing loops with tanker mm -hmm. shuttles, and so that never really registered to me. So I'm just going to use this section down here. So you have a fire like midway here, so you have a water source on either side, but you're not just going up here and turning around, right? You yeah, have no, to and this road actually turns to dirt about here down. So it's pretty much a one lane road. It's really small, windy, um, actually pretty heavily traveled because there's a couple of really well used hiking trails here. So we get a lot of out of towners actually traveling yep. this road, which is an additional hazard. But yeah, for a loop, you don't want to be, you don't want tankers having to pass each other on the road. So we would want, if we were going to use this water source up here and our fire was down here, we would dump our water, come all the way up, refill, and we'd probably end up going out into Hamden and down and around to dump again. And, um, and for references, is to have tankers passing each other. Right, and so for reference, that doesn't look like a lot on this map, but how long is that total loop? With a tanker, uh, I would say it's probably a good 20 minutes, maybe a little bit longer by the time you, and if you're counting fill and dump time, you're looking at 30, 40 minutes. So this is that call them early, call them often, yeah, cancel call them, them early, if you need them. Yeah, call them often if you need to cancel them, great. Um, you know, our, our, we have a really good relationship with our neighboring communities and, and they don't mind coming to help out and they don't usually mind coming and getting canceled because we would do the same for them. So yeah, if you're, if we're really out of district on these far corners and we know that water is going to be a problem, we just call as early as we can and we can specifically request, um, say we want a second alarm tanker only. And gotcha. We'll call all of our tankers on that alarm part. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, let's go take a look at your engine. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so this is your engine tube. Yes. Um, I think it's cool to, especially going around to like smaller departments, is you guys carry a lot of stuff on these engines, and you guys have some like 
stuff that helps you with your kind of unique setup. So sure. um, I just want to kind of go around the MP engine real quick. You don't have to talk about everything. A lot of it's the same, but some some of the cool stuff I saw in here. So you guys have this camera system, yep. right? So what does this do? So the camera sees all sides of the truck uh, so that it allows the pump operator to see all sides of the truck without having to walk around. So we talked about drafting and uh, water being an issue. A lot of times when we are suctioning from a tank or drafting from a water tank, it's either in the front or the back. Um, the last thing you want to do is lose your water supply. So the operator has to keep a really close watch on how much water is in that tank. Um, right. Without the camera, they're constantly walking back or to the front to check the level. This way they can just flip the camera, look at it. Okay, I'm good on water. We can keep drafting. That's, that's awesome. Again, it kind of highlights that like it gives you a little bit of an advantage where you where you have less staff. You kind of make some up with technology. Also, yeah. I don't know if you guys noticed my pretty sweet gloves. It's a little chilly today. Um, obviously, this is standard stuff, but I thought this little uh, this little drawer is pretty cool. Yep. But I also had never seen this before. And uh, can you uh, tell me what this thing is? Yeah, so that's an Augustus car fire tool. Uh, so obviously, it has that piercing nozzle. Um, so if you have a fire in the engine compartment, you can pierce the hood, drive it in, uh, hook your inch and three quarter up to it, and essentially put the fire out without opening the hood up. So you just come in and swing it like you would the yeah, pike on a halogen right into the hood. And, pound it in there. and and you can hit it if you need to. Yeah, so if you're going through something a little more sturdy. End, so if you really needed to get it down in there, you definitely could. That's awesome. I like that thing. And I uh, appreciate the uh, grip tape wraps. Yes, that's right at your eye level too, that end of that halogen. With the little, uh, the little bubble on it. Uh, fun fact, Barry and I, we wrapped, we, when we were on the engines together, we did a hockey tape wrap on our Halligan with like our, all of our engines are, have specific colors, you know, which tools yeah, go to, yeah, to what. Right. And um, it's still there, although they didn't like it at first. Um, yeah. Uh, some electric PPVs. Yes, that's our electric PPV. We have one on our other engine as well, but that one's our brand new one. Um, Really light, easy to carry around, very versatile. It's got a fun name too. The, it does. The, the, what is it, Blowhard? Yeah, what is this called? It's a, uh, if you want to peek your head, I can read it. Oh, it's a quickie blowhard. A quickie blowhard, ah, ladies and gentlemen, a quickie blowhard. 1,000 feet or 1,500 feet of beautifully packed five inch LDH. That is, that is nice. You like seeing that. If somebody shows up, you like seeing that. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out, um, in my first apartment when I worked in Wayland, we used hydrant assist valves, but not everybody uses these. Yeah. So you guys carry them. Can you just tell us quickly what the purpose of the hydrant assist valve is? Sure. So we only carry one now just on our mutual aid engine um, because our water, our hydrants in town have pretty good pressure. But essentially, uh, you can hook up to the steamer connection on the hydrant, and then your front connection is going to be your to the fire connection. Um, so if you don't need to boost your hydrant, you're just using that connection. If you do need to, what's called boost your hydrant, I can hook up another line, hook it up to my pump, and essentially increase the pressure coming out of that hydrant um, so that we can have more water. Right. Especially, so that's really good for like relay operations too. If yeah, you need to like. Operations, um, if you're in an area that has just poor pressure, then you have a little bit of capability to, to boost it. So I'll be honest, this is one of those things like, you know, there's always something on, on a vehicle or whatever it is that you're like, you're always like, I know it, but like, Every time you're like, I have to think about it, and it's just because yeah. you have to open it like through these, and it blows yeah, so water out the valve. side, and it's a ball valve inside. So basically, you want the arm in the where you want the water to be flowing. Right. Right. So yeah, when you do open it from the hydrant, you're gonna get some water out one side until you get it in the full. Position. Definitely washed a few cars with that I'm by sure. accident. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see what else you guys have over here. Um, you guys actually carry struts, which is pretty cool, and you guys. Um, you guys have these for stabilization, right? Yeah, so we uh, were able to get the Paratech struts uh, through a grant last year. Uh, before that, we were using rescue jacks, which we still do carry on our rescue. Yep. Uh, same weight capacity. The Paratechs are just a lot more user-friendly. Um, they are able to go into a lot smaller spaces in the rescue jacks, yeah. which can be convenient. Uh, right now, they are stabilization only, so you lift with the air pack, stabilize with the strut. Uh, we're looking into our next grant round of grants getting uh, Paratech makes what's called a hydro seal so you can actually lift with the strut right. eliminating the need for the airbag which is great which is pretty cool we yeah. had the rescue jacks um, when I was in Wayland and uh, they work great but they are like running all of the the straps and stuff like that and the chains yeah. and stuff they can be a little and bit they have a little a bit tricky height you know these can right. go down as small as six inches off of the base so you really right. have a lot of leeway in your size 
choices. That's awesome. Um, standard battery setup, but uh, not not something you see in every department. Is you guys actually carry a full complement of Jaws setups yep. because again, like limited staffing, you can't roll two or three different trucks to a call. Right. So you gotta yeah, so gotta roll some of the stuff. All all of our full set of Jaws is on this truck. Uh, we keep a combi tool on the mutual aid truck in case we do get called mutual aid and, and have to utilize that. But So we have the spreaders, cutters, and ram on here, electric, um, and then the full set of backup batteries, obviously, that charges off the truck, uh, which right. is great if you have a long-term operation. And Sorry, I just noticed, and this is a nice setup here. You have your airbags. Yep, we've got our too. airbags there. Tanks are on the top, and we've got the big long guy tucked in on the side there. Oh, yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, I, we carry, uh, on the squad on my company, we carry a Genesis tool, which is battery operated, but it's kind of a, a, a combi and, uh, I like, I like it, but, uh, these are some, these are beasts. Yeah. It's great to not have to deal with the hydraulic lines, you know, chasing Absolutely. them and watching those, but they're a great tool. We've really enjoyed using them since we got them. And this is one of those things, like as like the, the evolution in technology develops, you know, like you think, oh, battery, you yeah. know, a set of jaws, like, eh, hey, these things are. Are awesome. Yeah, and I think that was everyone's hesitation, I think, when these first came on the market. Like, how could it be as strong as right. your, your traditional hydraulic tool? And, you know, as they went out and did demos and showed you the real the real capacity of it, it was a, kind of a no-brainer, I think, for most departments. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, let's go check out your tanker. Yeah, let's do it. So, uh, there's not a whole lot to this truck as far as, like, compartments and stuff yeah. like that. But I think it's really cool to show people, like, having to not only go fight a fire, but bring your own water supply to it. Yeah. And so this is a 3000 gallon tanker. Mm -hmm. um, it, what I just learned is it's not baffled or only partially baffled. Right. So this is a dangerous truck to drive. It is, uh, tankers and water tenders in general, uh, if you are interested in researching it, are the most dangerous truck in the fire service, most accident prone, obviously prone to rolling over. Um, a lot of your LODs involving a vehicle, it's usually a tanker. Right. So it's dangerous to drive. It's dangerous to drive full. It's dangerous to drive partially full. Um, it's we train a lot on the tanker specifically in the fleet because of that. Right. So if you had to, to just in my, just me thinking, if you had a half a tank of this, it would almost be more difficult to drive than a full tank because you're giving room for that water yeah, to shift. You and, really have to think about your stopping length. Um, yeah. And really start planning those stops and turns ahead of time and make sure you're you're really at the right speed. And you're talking if you're three thousand gallons, that's twenty four thousand pounds of just water. Just water, yeah. And even half of that, so twelve thousand pounds, you know, making yeah. a turn if that thing's yeah. halfway full is, is crazy. Mm -hmm. Um what is uh what's down here in this compartment? So this is our uh connections. So if we're gonna be dumping somewhere, this is our water chute. Yep. So we can hook that on, it can dump from three sides. Um <clears throat> typically we'll either leave it on or leave it at the dump site. And so whoever's riding with you, it's their job to get out and hook the chute when we get there so that we can dump. Um and then we've got a couple other different connections if we need to go down to four inch sorts for filling yep. based on whoever is at the fill site. Um, this is typically how we fill with a two and a half. Uh, and then we have a portable pump if we should need it. Uh, it's an old hail pump, but it works. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's right. So I just want to explain um, to people this vacuum tanker system because this is a new concept mm -hmm. to me. Correct me if I'm wrong. So yeah. basically, when you dump this tank, mm -hmm. you create this tank becomes a vacuum. So when you open it back up, it is just drawing water in. There's no pump action to it. So it does have a PTO uh, inside. So we don't vacuum or pressure dump a lot. Right. Um, usually a gravity dump is good enough. Uh, when you pressure dump, of course, you're pushing the water out faster. You're creating kind of more of a hazard at that dump site. Um, so we don't vac we don't pressure dump a lot, but yes. We close the vent, uh, essentially pressurizing the tank and pushing the water out. Um, and then the opposite to suck the water in. Pull all the air out of the tank and then you open it. Yep. One of the things the chief was saying, an advantage of that is you could put holes in your suction and while it won't be as efficient, you won't lose prime yeah, and, and you'll so still be able to a, go. An engine, if we're drafting off an engine or to an engine, if you lose that prime, you've essentially lost your water. Right. Uh, where that doesn't happen here because the truck is generating its own suction. And we're, and we're talking about doing tanker shuttles, not to hydrants. We're talking about doing tanker shuttles to ponds and lakes and yeah. places where you're actually yeah. drafting, not just doing tanker we shuttles. We could be drafting. Uh, we could be using a hydrant as a fill. Uh, that's way further away from the fire because obviously right. we don't want to draw from that supply. 
Um, but a lot of times it's from a static water source. Yeah. Um, and then, so you have, we'll go around the other side. So this is our porta tank. Uh, this whole piece flips down and allows us to pull this big square tank out. It will hold all 3000 gallons. So that's the first thing we establish if we're establishing that we do need a water supply. Uh, we usually lay a tarp down so that we aren't puncturing the bottom of the tank with rocks and whatnot. Yep. Throw it down wherever it needs to be in placement to the engine that's pumping and uh, fill it up and then get on our way to find more water. That's awesome. So you pull up on scene, hit the brake, set the brake to having that tank full of water. What's the time frame? Um, with a good crew, it's going to take three minutes to dump the tank itself and probably another three to four to get it set up. So you're under 10 minutes. And, and you don't have to have the full tank dumped before you can start drawing, right? So if you had a thousand gallons in it, you could start yeah, drawing as from soon the other as, pump. As soon as you can pull a draft out of that tank, so depending if you have a low level suction or a floating suction right. um, strainer, then as soon as you're able to, so we carry a low level on here as well as on one of our engines. So the low level can suck out of three inches of water. Yeah, so so you're talking in reality to being able to draft water and put water to the fire five minutes. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thanks for showing us this. Yeah, um, yeah, that's it. That's all I have. I awesome. appreciate it. I think it's really cool to, um, to go around to see different departments. You know, like we say, like, you know, Departments vary so widely from all volunteer to mix to blend um, yeah. departments to, to big cities, whatever. And everybody's got their own unique stuff. So Definitely. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to show us all this. Yeah, thanks for coming. All right.